As I'm sure you know by now, um, early this morning, our time, uh, there was a terrorist attack in New York and in Washington, D.C. Called me this morning at 8.56 a.m. from the 101st floor to tell me that there was smoke in the room. I'm the director of neurosurgery at one of our trauma hospitals, and I know what's going on right there, right now. My first reaction was, as a Muslim, hey, this is retribution. There are people in the world today, right this moment, who are celebrating at their success of pulling off an amazing logistical nightmare. Muslims feel, hey, listen, you came into my home, took, you know, my home, and you kicked me out. Neither I nor anybody I know was ever raised with the concept of being a suicide bomber. And then you give back, like, a little bathroom to me, and I'm supposed to celebrate? And when I'm not celebrating, you come and kick my ass? A real warrior, not a thug who calls himself a warrior so he can feel better about himself. A thug is out just to create violence. Do it again. And it's all here in your heart, too. So if you kill, you're killing a part of yourself. On September 11, 2001, as the towers burned in New York, all over the country, children were looking up at their parents or their teachers for guidance. College students were arguing with each other and with their professors. People went to work and hoped that the manager, the CEO, or the president of the company would have words of guidance. Everyone heard the president promising retaliation. Anthony Robbins was asleep in Hawaii when the towers were hit. That day was to be the second day of a conference on leadership that he was teaching to 2,000 participants from 40 countries with about 100 New Yorkers, many of whom had lost family, friends, and entire businesses that morning. For a moment, Robbins considered canceling the event. But he reconsidered. When evil happens, for life to make sense, some good must come from that evil. When tragedy strikes, if life is to have meaning, some good must result from the tragedy. This film is a condensed version of the day's events demonstrating how to create leaders in times of crisis and how to define metaframes where violence is not possible. One thing that is certain is that there will be times of pain, suffering, and crisis in everyone's life. It is my hope that this film will give you some tools to bring out the best in yourself and in others at those times. Since dawn, participants had been crying, screaming, and fighting with each other. Their reaction reflected the diversity of reactions taking place around the world. In New York, some had an immediate emotional reaction to the tragedy. Others were shocked and unresponsive. Some people were terrorized and fled the city. while others immediately headed towards the disaster scene in order to help. Around the world, some people reacted with anger and focused on revenge. Others demonstrated in the streets, some as a show of support for the victims, others as a dance of victory. Most people felt the attacks to be a sharp interruption of life as they knew it, and many saw the tragic events as the end of an era. 
The subject scheduled for the conference that day had originally been emotional mastery. How each individual has the capacity to choose the emotions to be experienced. Robbins decided to preserve the theme of emotional mastery while focusing on the day's tragic events. The film is a condensed version of the 10-hour day where Robbins begins with large group interventions, moves to working with small groups, then to individuals, until he focuses on two men, a New York Jew and a Pakistani who stood up to represent the Muslim point of view. Through indirect negotiation, Robbins transforms the young Muslim into an activist for peace, and in so doing, he unifies the large group's emotional experience in the direction of growth and contribution. The attack on the towers on September 11 was the trigger for many of the conflicts that face the world today. This film is about how to create peace and is a contribution to the understanding of the emotions of those who are in a position to negotiate for peace. Facing the challenge of how to create an empowering meaning that would unify and serve the large group, Robbins decided to restructure the day's teachings into five parts. He began by redefining the situation with the purpose of developing leadership. Next, he created a sense of community by appealing to higher common values. Third, the participants were invited to re-examine and analyze their initial emotional reactions to the news. And fourth, to discuss them with each other. Finally, a process of indirect negotiation between two men who occupied opposite poles of belief served to integrate the diversity of views represented in the room. As I'm sure you know by now, um, early this morning, our time, uh, there was a terrorist attack in New York and in Washington, D.C., and four airplanes were hijacked. Um, the airplanes were leaving for the West Coast, and they uh, hit to the World Trade Centers and hit both towers, and they imploded and were destroyed, and probably 10 to 20,000 people probably died in the process. And there's a great deal of horror, as you can imagine, there, and people working very hard to salvage any human life that's still there in that situation. A lot of other people who witnessed the experience of horror, a lot of people in this room who probably have family members there with concerns. It's very difficult to communicate based on the phone lines. Uh, and then in Washington, D.C., the Pentagon was hit, and there's been a great destruction there. And then there was another plane that landed outside of Pennsylvania. Um, so this is emotional mastery. And so it's an opportunity for us to figure out how do you focus on, what do you focus on, what does this mean, what do you do? And from a leadership perspective, I think the first focus has to be who needs to be served and cared for. And so the first focus is who is directly affected by this. And there are people in this room who are directly affected by this. And when I think everyone here's hearts go out to you and our, our love is there for you, but more than just our love, we want to do everything we can to support you personally. So the experience that's happening right now is radically different for everyone here, radically different. Some people are saying, what are you upset about? This stuff happens in my country every day. Maybe not as dramatically, in some cases more dramatically. Some people are angry and they want to attack somebody. Some people are going to look at the Islam culture in a very ugly way when it's not a culture that's generated this, it's not a people that's generated this, it's a few individuals that have made some choices and they're going to be in a different point of view. There's all kinds of things to focus on. There's all kinds of meanings which will create emotions and there's all kinds of actions. I think as leaders, our responsibility, one, is focus on who we can help. Two, is to find an empowering meaning in anything life gives you. If you don't find an empowering meaning, then what you're really doing is indulging, especially if it doesn't affect you directly. Now, I'm not talking about somebody who lives in that community because if it was your hometown and somebody came and blew up a building, you start to look at it differently. But six million people died in Africa recently, and most people didn't give a shit. My belief is simple. I believe three things. Number one, in life, you got to see things as it is, but not worse than it is. And if you see it worse than it is, you're doing that to connect with yourself. You're doing that to connect with other people. You're doing that as a drama queen or king. 
but also you don't want to not see it as it is. You don't want to pretend like nothing happened because that's bullshit. This is a severe strike and it certainly affects the psychology and the certainty and the caring and the emotions and the fears of people living in this nation and other nations too who use this as a model of maybe where certainty or security may be. But you don't want to make it worse than it is. Second is you got to see it better than it is because if you don't see it better than it is, you're not a leader. Because if you don't see it better than it is, with no compelling future, then what people do is just sit around. And the third thing is when you see it better than it is, you got to do something to make it better. At some level, no matter how small it is, every small action helps to make something happen. And I was encouraged this morning as I walked around and talked with people to see so many people focus on wanting to do something rather than just sitting and crying or feeling sad. And you have the right to do that. But if it isn't directly affecting you, you have to ask yourself why you're doing that. You could say, because I have so much compassion, and I'll buy that for a period of time, but if it lasts two or three or four or five or 10 days, then you better do this the rest of your life because there are plenty of people you could have that same caring for. I believe that caring needs to be reflected in action. And the way that action can happen is an empowering meaning. If I think you're indulging, I'm gonna keep asking you what needs you're meeting by doing this. If you're taking action, you'll have my total support because I think anything we can do. So one of the things we can do, a couple of things we can do. Number one is there's gonna be a major need for blood. And so I'm arranging to make a blood drive here at this person program. So we're going to arrange to have them come here and be able to take our blood for any of those who want to donate your blood. That is a real resource. That's a real contribution. And by the way, it'd be better to be in a positive state because it affects your blood. We're going to change the entire format of this day, and we're going to use this as a phenomenal tool for emotional mastery. But let's first think about the people that need our direct help instead of ourselves. That would be the families people here that may not even know how their families are doing. That'd be the workers that are out there right now trying to save people who are giving their heart and soul. That'd be anyone who's dealing with this crisis who needs additional strength. Send love and send light and send prayers to them in whatever way it makes sense to you. And let's do that for a moment of silence for one minute. Here we go. Many people at the conference felt that the intense destruction in New York deserved an equally intense emotional response on their own part. Others felt numb and worried that their reaction wasn't intense enough. Some were secretly pleased and excited. Many had been awake and upset since 3 a.m. and now felt demoralized and emotionally exhausted. In order to restore their emotional resources, Robbins will guide the group through an intense emotional experience of gratitude, appreciation, and the possibility of a new empowering vision which all could share. It's usually after great pain that people begin to make new choices or begin to appreciate things they've begun to take for granted, like basic freedoms. This can truly serve. It's up to us whether it does or not. You must create a vision of something greater. See it as it is, then see it better than it is, and make it the way you now see it. That's what a leader does. They create a vision for more. Think about all the people that right now that are laughing, and if you could absorb all their laughter in your body. All over the earth, there are people laughing right now. All over this world right now, there are people kissing. Right now. All over this world, absorb all their kisses. If you're gonna absorb all the pain, you better take up all of humanity's love too because otherwise you're not picking a balance. Because a real leader is here to serve, not their own needs, but the greater good, and so doing their needs are met as well. You can't give strength to someone else unless you have it inside you. You can't give love to someone else unless you've given it to yourself, and you sure can't create an exciting life if the only time you can be excited is when there are no problems. Because if you're waiting for a time when there are no problems and there's no pain and there's no tragedy and there's no injustice before you celebrate, then you're never gonna celebrate again as long as you live or you're gonna have to focus only on a very small part of the world. Don't be selective in your caring, don't be selective in your pain. Create gratitude now. From that place, there'll be more of you to give. If you look for the good, it's always there. What's wrong is always available, whether you show it on the news or not. And so is what's right. Right now, there are children being born into a world where they will be loved. Right now, there are people being saved in hospitals all across this country. Right now, there are lives being turned around by people who care. 
everywhere in this moment, life is brewing and growing and expanding all over this earth. Life always moves forward, it never moves backward. Children are laughing, people are achieving. If this was just one more event in your life, another piece of the fabric coming together to create more of you, the real you showing up, what would you decide to do? How would you decide to deal with tragedy? What decision could you make? Because in a state of certainty, you know what's right, not what I know, what you know. You have to make your own choices. So you can all share our point of view, but you got to make your own choices. What's right for you to do? How can you use this? What can you remember about humanity or about yourself? What emotions are available at any moment for you? In talking about gratitude, Robbins began with a comforting theme of appreciating one's own blessings. But he gradually expanded the circle of appreciation until it included the experience of humanity as a whole. Robbins encouraged the audience to deliberately assume the responsibility of leadership, to get outside of themselves, resolve their own inner turmoil, so they could have resources to go back and make a difference in their communities. He wanted to make sure that everyone in the room used this as an opportunity to become more resourceful, not just that day, but in their lives, to go back home and be a positive force. The participants were then asked to re-examine the moment in which they first heard of that morning's destruction in order to better understand the way they habitually produce meaning. What did you focus on when you first thought about this? When you first heard it, and you probably had several things. You focused on one thing and then another and then another. Is that true? And then as you focused it, what meaning did you give to that? And then what did you decide out of that? Did you decide you have to be more careful? Did you decide you just have more faith? Did you decide to put things in balance? Did you decide to be more grateful? Did you decide to give some blood? What did you decide before we talked this morning? I want to know what, how you processed initially, what you focused on, what meaning you gave, what you did in your head, what action you think you do. And then we're going to do a little analysis together so we can see the diversity. We're going to have you be in groups of seven people so you really get a different set of perspectives. Here, Robbins explains some frameworks for how people produce meaning, starting from the fact that a stimulus, such as that morning's news, prompts one to ask questions. All emotions are based on a triad of three areas of experience working together, physiology, focus, and language patterns. This triad is represented by the triangle that Robbins is now drawing on the board. Whatever stimulates it, somebody's request, somebody's demand, somebody's interest, television, whatever. What will control your focus, though, day to day, even with that stimulus, is questions. So if when this happened, the question you asked yourself was, and your focus was like, oh my God, who did this? Then we know what's going to happen. You're going to move towards anger. If your question was, how could man do this to man? What's, what's humanity coming to? Then you've gone to a different place. If you went to a question like, God, I wonder how these families are dealing with that. You're going to come up with a different set of emotions. If your question was, how can I really serve in this area? How can I help? You're going to go to a different place. Your questions control your focus, and your focus will control your feelings because it will move you towards a meaning. It will move you in a direction. Day to day, moment to moment, it's your questions. What controls your focus throughout your life is your values. So if you value, for example, security as your highest value, I know this event is unnerving for you, right? If you value, let's say, making a difference, some part of you actually has maybe a sense of excitement about this because you know that these are the kinds of moments, these are defining moments in which you can truly make a difference in the world. Day to day, people don't pay attention. People pay attention when there's pain. People want help when there's pain. So it all depends on what you value. A core concept in Robin's thinking is that all human behavior is driven by six basic human needs. The first four are the needs of the personality and are essential to human functioning. The last two, growth and contribution, are spiritual needs, 
which are essential to human fulfillment. All six human needs can be met in negative or positive ways. For example, in a situation such as September 11, many people experienced a loss of significance and certainty, which could lead them to the emotion of anger. Anger restores the sense of significance, the angry person feels important, and certainty, the angry person knows who is to blame. Even though a destructive emotion such as anger doesn't feel good, it is difficult to abandon it when it satisfies two or more needs. The goal is to find more positive and sustainable ways of meeting one's needs so that one can rise above one's own personal emotional challenges and address higher quality problems that can lead to helping others. It is ultimately by serving others that all six human needs are met most intensely. If you value significance more than anything else, you're pissed off about this if you're an American. Right? If you value certainty, you may be pissed off because you're afraid you're going to lose that, so you get into anger as a way of overcoming that. If you value connection, you probably are trying to think of all the people you can connect with, or you probably called people you care about about the situation, or you shared it, because that's the highest thing you have. If you value variety, this is like, you know, wow, this is drama, this is terrible, but it's a little exciting for you. Because there's no bad or good here. This is about authentically knowing how you react to situations. And you might look at somebody and be upset they're not reacting the way you're reacting, but no one's going to react exactly the way you're going to react except somebody who has your exact model of the world. And if you limit your life to people to share all your same beliefs and values and rules, you better put yourself on a tiny, small little island with very few people. To be part of humanity, you have to appreciate all these points of view and then allow them, may, some of them may influence you as we talk about this. Because again, some people are going to be in your group and they go, this is bullshit. People die every damn day. Oh, now because it's this dramatic way it's done, you're going to be upset and someone else is going to go, how could you say that? My family's in New York City, right? Or someone's going to say, you know, I don't know. I think, you know, this is America's payback for all the shit they've done. And someone's going to go, what? We do more things for the world? So this could be a really inspiring conversation. Or if you start to get hooked, ah, 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 if you feel yourself ah, getting hooked by something someone's saying, instead of getting hooked by them, you gotta realize you're the one who's hooked. It has nothing to do with them. Why is this bothering you so much? What is it that you're overvaluing for you to get this upset? Because you're getting that upset, something you're probably overvaluing, you're valuing too much, you're valuing it more than the relationship or the learning of the conversation. See if you can stay fascinated by the unique different ways instead of judgment about everybody's point of view. The group was then asked to break off into small groups of five to seven people, each group including at least one American and one non-American. The purpose of these discussions was to examine the relationship between one's initial emotional reactions and one system of meaning, as well as to observe this relationship in other participants. Confronted by the sheer diversity of emotional meanings, it became clear that each individual's particular combination of questions, values, beliefs, and needs is unique. This recognition that one's emotional reality exists only in oneself prompts a sense of ownership and responsibility for the meaning one wants to create. After the large group reconvened, Robbins called on individual participants to share their experience. You will see that these conversations follow three steps characteristic of Robbins' human need psychology. First, Robbins will seek to identify the person's most highly valued needs, desires, beliefs, and rules. To influence a person, you must know what already influences them, what is their model of the world. Next, Robbins will identify the meaning the person associates with the possibility of taking steps toward change, that is, the barriers to progress. Then, Robbins interrupts the old pattern of meaning or emotion and provides a new alternative that more effectively meets the needs of the individual or the group. The first man he calls on is Assad. What's your name, where are you from? Assad, 
I'm from Berkeley, California. Okay. Originally from Pakistan. Originally from Pakistan. So, I'm a Muslim. In my group, there was actually a gentleman who had a pretty uh, associated experience. His girlfriend was in the area when this whole thing happened. I had a very different experience. Other people had different experience. There was a gentleman who, um, I guess he works with Red Cross or one of those organizations. So it was very different and it was great to get a perspective to, uh, to see where everybody else is coming from. My first reaction was that I, I didn't give this any meaning. I, I just thought, let's see what happens. My fear was that me and people like me are going to be branded immediately, you know. Um, so you did give it a meaning. <laughs> but it was, it was kind of mild. Yes. <laughs> mild. I'll be branded for life. There's a mild meaning. No, no. Not, not, not. <laughs> I've already, I mean. I'm not <laughs> criticizing you. I totally, no, I okay. totally feel for you. I just want to point out there's no such thing as not creating a meaning. But there is what you did, which is, okay, I'm starting creating a meaning. I'm, you went to a maybe mode. Let's see. Which is very intelligent of you. But go ahead. Continue. Yeah. So um, it took a lot of courage for me. I, I just I wanted to say in the group what I thought would be the right thing to say, which is like, oh, this is really bad and, you know, it's horrible and people have died and this should never happen. But I thought that, you know, if I'm not going to step up and, like you said, emotional mastery is about being you first. Yes, I agree. So um, I thought, you know, my first reaction was, as a Muslim, hey, this is retribution. That was a kind of a feeling. It wasn't like a judgment, like, yeah, you know, this is great. You know, finally somebody, it was kind of like a feeling like of um, maybe camaraderie or understanding, like somebody's going to understand where, you know, Muslims are coming from when they do things like this, wherever they do it in the world. And then the second thing was, for me, it was, I wish I could be there so that, you know, Whatever. Maybe I could uh, just hold somebody's hand. Or uh, maybe I could just, you know, sit by somebody. Or, or whatever. Whatever level of contribution that I could give, I wish I could do that. When you said that people would understand where Muslims are coming from, help us understand. Because I don't know if the people will. I don't know if people will look at that and say, okay, now I know the pain they've been through and that's what's driving them. Why don't you give us your perspective? Okay, it was uh, it, during the Gulf War. It was about nothing except money, oil. That's all it was about. It wasn't about Saddam Hussein. It wasn't about any of that. It was about oil. That's what it was about. And in the American newspapers, I don't think anybody ever remembers reading how many people, innocent people, died in Iraq. They, all, they had this thing, oh, we've got smart bombs, and we've got smart this, and we've got smart that. But the only people that died, most of the people that died, were civilians, children, women, old men. And a lot of people that actually went to fight, they were civilians in soldiers' clothes. How that relates to you for this bombing is, because do you see the, do you see the diverse reactions within him? Because he wants to be there to hold somebody's hand, but he also understands why it happens. Which means he has conflicting triads within himself in terms of the experience here. How many see this? Let me see your hand. Now, what he has is the courage to express what he really feels in an environment that wouldn't be very popular. Which I, I acknowledge so, explain to us though, how that relates uh, in terms of this bombing for you then. You see the injustice happen there, so it's like what comes around, goes around kind of thing, or karma, or what's the relationship for you? That, you, that first reaction you had? First reaction was simply that somebody else will understand my feeling of frustration and maybe... What's the feeling of frustration based on? Because I doubt seriously if many people understand their frustration because of this. I think what they'll probably do is want to retaliate just the way you fear. 
I doubt seriously if that event will cause people to understand. Absolutely, I agree with that. I think that's why there's so much violence all over the world has been perpetrated in the Middle East, in you know, Bosnia, and all these places, is because what people do is they take the pain they have and they decide the way to get rid of it is to give it back to somebody else. Exactly, that's that's exactly what I mean. That people, the the whole Israel Palestine issue, it's it's all about. Muslims feel, hey, listen, you came into my home, took, you know, my home, and you kicked me out, and you raped my wife and my daughter and everything, and then you give back, like, a little bathroom to me, and I'm supposed to celebrate, and when I'm not celebrating, you come and kick my ass? So that's what Muslims feel. On the other hand, the people who are doing all these things, they feel, hey, listen, we're powerful, We'll do whatever it takes to protect our interests. There's no right, there's no wrong. I don't feel there's a lot of the violence is being perpetrated. Like I said, during the Gulf War, it was economics, it's politics. The people who die, they don't care about all of this, or maybe some of them do, but what they do care about is their mothers and their fathers and their daughters and their sons, and they don't wanna die, they, don't, they just wanna live, they just wanna be happy, just like everybody else. And I don't know, I guess, so that, yeah, I guess you're right. I have mixed emotions in, in, in the sense that I, I, I wish that somebody would stop and sometimes just think, you know, whether I'm Muslim or whether I'm Jewish or whether I'm American or Bosnian or whatever, I, I want to be happy. And I want to do the things in life that make me happy. And if somebody takes that right away from me, you know, to do the things that I want to do, then I want to retaliate, I want to do something. But I don't think people understand that. People just say, oh, these, these are bad guys, let's kill them. And whether that's, Americans that's, do it or Muslims do it, it's, that's true. I don't it doesn't make it right. So, uh, so the challenge is to keep doing the same thing that doesn't work over and over and over again. Retaliate, the other side doesn't understand, they retaliate back. The other side doesn't understand, they retaliate back. And so we have all this violence. And the violence is because of one thing. Because when people are hurt, one way to get out of pain is get angry, because when you get angry, you get certain and you feel significant. Because when someone takes things, you feel insignificant and you feel uncertain. And so anger is the way to return to that. But anger runs its course so it starts to eat you up and then people start to feel sad. So I don't have an answer for you on a humanity basis. I can only tell you the answer on an individual basis, that if you continue with the anger you've got, you won't be able to do this. And you're far advanced because you have the ability to have both emotions. And I respect you immensely for, and share them. I respect you immensely first for being willing to tell us the truth of what you feel and to show it to us. I respect you immensely because you also have the ability to have compassion because many people could not get beyond their anchor and say, I'd like to be there and hold somebody's hand. They just go, hey, they deserve it. I don't know them anyway, they're faceless. So your evolution as a soul, as a spirit, is quite accelerated compared to most people. But the, the reason you're here, my guess is, like why we're all here, there's a spiritual reason we're all here together. We're here for a reason. This is not a mistake. And one woman was telling me she's feeling guilty. She's so guilty because she, she, she should be back home to help other people. And I'm gonna bring a group of people up here so you can watch the interaction. And she's here because she's got that guilt all the time. The woman who's angry is angry all the time. This is just a new reason. These are patterns. All this event is is an opportunity for you to run the triads you already run with more intensity. So he gets to run the triads. He's had a frustration for some time. She gets to run her anger. Somebody else runs their guilt. Somebody else runs their sadness. And it's a magnifier, a massive magnifier, but people go where they live. And if you want to change the world, you got to change yourself and then your friends. And you got to go back and do what nobody else will do. I have not had your experience. I have not had my family raped you know, by someone who stole my home and took it from me. I've had pains that I thought were intense. I'm sure not as intense as the pains you've experienced or your family's experienced. So I have zero judgment. Robbins had been informed of Assad's background and knew that he came from a family where no one had been raped or displaced. He knew that Assad was speaking metaphorically and had taken a position as a representative of the Muslims in the room and in the world. Robbins has accepted Assad's position as a metaphor for one of the extreme polarities represented in the large audience. Even more, he addresses Assad as if he truly were in a position of leadership in his community. 
have respect for you, for being able to share what you have. And my only invitation to you, since I know you want one or you wouldn't have stood up, is to say, if you continue to make it okay to retaliate, even in your head, then you contribute to the problem of what was done to you. And so you gotta somehow find a way, in my opinion, this is my opinion. If you want to tell me I'm full of shit, I'm totally okay with that because I'm not you. But in my opinion, if you allow that space in your head, which you have every right to have, then you're not Nelson Mandela. And people say, I can't do that. That's horseshit. Every person's a Nelson Mandela. Everybody's got it in them. Whether they choose to or not has to do with are you selfish or are you focused on the greater good. So for you, I don't have an easy answer. But I'm curious, do you think, if you and you have every right to do it, if you keep that awareness, that feeling of now they understand, do you think they really understand? That's my first question. No. No. Then how can you as one individual make a difference if you still understand yourself, if it's still a little bit okay inside of you because you understand? Or do you have to extract that out and go to the next level like Mandela did, which Mandela doesn't have one ounce of it's okay for that violence in him. He doesn't have one ounce of it. That's why he led a nation that couldn't be led, supposedly, and has integrated people that couldn't be integrated. And taken people who've been killed and abused and got them not to use violence. That's a unique individual. But you can't take somebody else to a place you've not been. Leaders have to go there first. And if you really live there, you can take anybody there. If you don't live there, forget taking somebody there. So either you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. How do you do it? I, the question that I have is, and I'm not positive how, because I'm not you. The question would be, could I get myself to a place where I realize that I'm actually killing my own brethren if I make it okay for them to, even though they're justified, to feel enough justification to induce violence on others? Because then what I do is I am part of reinforcing the cycle that has destroyed my community in the first place. We see Assad experiencing a significant change as he perceives that the beliefs that serve as the basis for his wish for retribution are unrealistic. Retaliation doesn't lead to the understanding he desires, but only to further blind retaliation, as well as further pain for the people he cares for. So the question becomes, having rapidly changed his intellectual belief, how does he now extinguish his emotional pattern that condones violence? This will develop into the primary question Assad will need to ask himself later in the day. Robbins has decided that Assad will be a primary focus of intervention, not only because he is interested in changing Assad as an individual, but because by changing Assad, he will influence everyone in the room in the direction of leadership. Now, Robbins will examine the belief in violence that Assad will have to discard. He will present Assad with an elevated view of himself, even equating him with Nelson Mandela, and so will influence him to live up to that expectation. What would happen if violence disappeared with all these young people? What would, what would they do? Violence is a way for you to merely have a mission in life, a purpose that's greater than yourself. It's heady. It gives you certainty to get in violence. It gives you significance. It's got variety, man. You never know what's going to happen next. Bombs going off. What's going to happen? What's going to go? It makes you feel alive. It gives you a sense of contribution to something larger. You feel a connection with the people that you're involved with us in. I guarantee you the people who are on that mission probably met all six of their needs in that mission. I guarantee you they felt a sense of contribution on a massive scale beyond themselves. They felt like they were growing to, to make this demand on themselves. They felt unbelievable certainty that they were doing the right thing, that they were finally making the payback happen, that justice was finally gonna be there. I guarantee you they made all six of these. Somebody who murders and somebody who sacrifices their own life to save another human being does it for the same reasons, same needs. Just different beliefs about how to make it happen. So those needs that were taken from people are not being taken from you now because you're in this room. So if you live there, you got a problem. If you let your friends live there, you're part of the problem. In my opinion, everybody's pain is real to them. And no one will ever understand somebody else's pain, but everybody understands their own. That's the challenge. Everybody's is. And there's not a person in this world who's not gonna experience a ton of it in their lifetime. 
The only question is, what are we going to do with it? That's going to be the question. So I don't know the answer. I'm not the guy who's wise about this. You are. But I love that you're willing to ask the question. Because if you ask the question, I know you'll come up with the right answer. Because you're seeking. This young woman is exhausted and drained after hours of crying. She had been in love with a man who died in 1999. About a year later, she had reluctantly fallen in love with another man. She was afraid of an intense involvement because of her grief over the first man's death. She came to the conference after telling her fiancé that she was not ready to marry him. During the first day of the conference, she changed her mind and left a message for him saying she would commit and she would marry him. Both she and her fiancé worked in the World Trade Center. My office was on the 101st floor of the Trade Center, and he and his brother owned the firm that were on the 101st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th floor. And he heard that message and called me this morning at 8.56 a.m. from the 101st floor to tell me that there was smoke in the room and an airplane had crashed into the building and he was about ready to lose his life and that he wanted me to know that he did love me and that he's sorry that we had to go through everything that we had to go through in order to know that we had to live in the moment and stop living in the past and mourning. I guess I'm just wanted to stand up here to, to, to remind everyone that it's important to let your emotions flow. Don't, don't bottle them up, but no matter what happens, not to get stuck like I did living in the past with that ball and chain so that you can't commit 100% to the present. And what, was, what was the lesson that, the spiritual lesson that's been given to you now with a giant hammer twice? You're a pretty powerful woman to handle this. I think first we should acknowledge this right now. You've got to live in the present and you've got to play full out, which is something that I've never really done. Yes. And I've always kind of stood on the sidelines and utilize, I think the worst experience can be your greatest asset. And in a situation like this, it, it has, these have both been my worst experience. I'm just so trying to utilize them to be my greatest asset to help everyone here if I can, to be more peaceful and, and to feel what you're feeling and to to live in the moment and appreciate what you have. Gratitude. Yes, that's wonderful. Maybe the additional one I might offer you that you've already thought of, but I'll just voice it. <laughs> yeah, I thought of it, I'm sure. <laughs> is to love in every moment. Yeah. Not just play out, full out. Because, well, you say you haven't played full out and you've been on the sidelines. I'm sure that's true some places. I bet there's true other places where you really did. You're not being fair to yourself. But it's good to generalize sometimes in order to move yourself to action. But the one, the love, the unconditional love, the love without fear, that's the piece that was missing. Yeah. And what a beautiful gift you have is the most painful gifts, if you can do what you've done, which I have to tell you, I, I cannot respect the person more than I do you right now. Thank you. Or send more love to you. I, my heart goes to you. I need that. You're giving a gift to everybody here. Because if you can find an empowering meaning in this and be such a beautiful soul and leader, and get the lesson that makes you live more now and love more now. And if you can know what a gift you had to have shared a love many people never will share with this man and have you both know it. My bet is that if you knew it was going to end this way in advance, but I don't know, I'm going to ask you, if you knew you'd only have the brief time but you'd really know you could have this kind of love or you could have never connected with this man, which would you have chosen? There's no doubt I would have done it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Give her a huge hand. Thanks. Bye -bye. Robin's hypothetical question, whether she would go through all of this again for the sake of love, gives her the opportunity to choose her current circumstances, including the pain. This choice strengthens her identity as someone who is determined to love and contribute under any circumstances. There's a spiritual lesson in all your pain. When you get the lesson, you get to let the go of the pain. It's up to you to find that lesson. It's there for everybody. 
and it usually seems invisible to you because you're not looking for it, you're just staring at the pain and wondering why you got the pain instead of saying, what is it in my awareness, my thoughts, my beliefs that's creating this pain? Because there is a level beyond this. The solution I look for in anyone's pain, and anybody when I walked around the room here, is I'm looking for what I call the global solution. The global solution is that every one of us has something we value more than our pain. And when you think about it, and you believe your pain is taking away that thing you value more than your pain, you'll drop your pain and you'll move. You'll do something. We will see that the words of this Iraqi doctor will impact the ultimate outcome of the conference. My name is Dr. Bashar. I live in London. I am originally from Iraq. I am an Arab. I am a Muslim. By the way, my only uh, request for the rest of this would be, whatever you're going to announce that you are, please add at the end, I'm a human. Because I think that's the one thing that we all are in this room. A member of the human family, which I know you are, sir. The greater purpose for this event is to open up a tremendous opportunity for people to understand each other and to come together and, and, and really uh, carry out a purpose of peace for the future. And so the lesson that I'd like all my brothers and sisters, especially the American people to take here, is for them, I would plead with them to look deeply into what is actually going on in the world, in the Middle East, what injustices have been taken place and has, has, has been carried out. And then for people to come together, for the Israeli to sit in front of the Arab and, and the American, sit together as people, go out, meet people who are viewed as the enemy, sit down with them, talk to them one to one, and form a huge lobby, a ground, a, a strong basis for lobbying, then all the governments will be forced to follow the path of peace. And this is the huge and the best thing that we could do for world peace as a group and as individuals. Robbins then invited a group of New Yorkers to share their initial reactions. He had already met with them privately as a group earlier that morning. Now he will ask each one to speak and so demonstrate how each person's model of the world determines the way they created meaning upon first hearing the news. People on the stage here are all from New York. They all had very different experiences. They're all on the same team, all from New York. They had very different experiences of what occurs. It, it brought up all of those feelings. No, this did not happen for the best. This is shit. I don't want to hear people saying that this, you know, this is something that happened for the best. This is horrible. It's horrific. And yes, maybe we can find meaning in it, but that's, we, we shouldn't be deluding ourselves into thinking that this is something that happened for the best. And what happened when we had the conversation? You still feel the same way? Has it changed? What's your mindset? You said that I live with anger and that I use it, and you're absolutely right with that. It is um, a tool that I've used in, in, in very often in my own life for good. You know, I get angry about something, and it's, you know, it's like it's jet fuel. She is certainly a rich enough human being emotionally to find other ways to get jet fuel. But I said, this is not the only place you do this. You've done this your whole life, and that's grabbed her. And I could see it because this was a well-oiled process, <laughs> and it is for all of us. However you've reacted to this situation is a well-oiled process. If we didn't have this situation, this pattern was already in you. Do you agree with me on that? Yes, I do. And so it can get triggered again by this issue, but it can right. be triggered by anything because this is right. a way to feel powerful and strong about standing up for what you believe in right. and not letting injustice be there, which are actually really beautiful and tense. Right. But it gets used in other areas too, and it gets used in a way that sometimes is destructive, certainly to you, if not right. to other people. When I finally got through and knew that everyone was okay, then I just started crying and crying and crying, and the tears just wouldn't stop. And what was really upsetting for me was I not only was thinking of the, the people that were in the trade center that were gone now, but the families that were home, specifically the children. We lived through, I lived through a circumstance in my family and, and the worst day of my life was when my uncle was killed at 43 about nine years ago. 
And it wasn't hearing that he was killed that was the worst part. It was sitting on the couch at 3 o'clock when his 8-year-old daughter came home and was told, Daddy's never coming home anymore. And I just imagined all, you know, the number was just terrific, 10,000 10, or plus, all those, those living rooms. I still wasn't certain that I could come into this room and play full out and, and get what I was here to, to really get. And my hands were trembling and stuff. And from the back of me, I don't know where she is, but I do want to give you a big hug, was the voice of an angel who started singing, We Are the World. When everyone grabbed hands and I'm hearing her voice behind me, the energy was just flowing through everybody. And I just knew that it was going to be okay. You're probably seeing models of the world up here. You're seeing people who have learned in their life different ways to meet their needs for certainty or variety or significance or connection. And you can also see people who have valued some things more than others. So for example, very clearly for Stacy, the healing force is something she values more, which is connection. When she has the connection with everybody else, then she can now come up with an empowering belief system. Because the, the need for connection is there, and now the empowering belief system is, yes, I can step up, yes, I am. We can do this together. Those are belief structures that she has. I'm the director of neurosurgery at one of our trauma hospitals out in Queens. And I know what's going on right there, right now. I know what has to be coordinated in order to get the doctors in and all the staff in, because we're on disaster code right now, because there's going to be casualties. And I thought to myself, what am I doing here? And it was a literal question. It wasn't uh, figurative. I said, what am I doing here? I should be back there. I should be treating the injured. I should be doing what I can to help the situation. What good am I here? And I couldn't shake that feeling the whole time. I was just sitting there in our group, and I was just thinking that I am I should be calling the Red Cross and finding out if they're having an airlift back to New York. So just let me get back there. And part of me was saying, well, that's, I mean, what are you really going to do out there? You know, it's, you're not going to get there until tomorrow anyway. And I was having a hard time resolving that issue. What was, what was the emotion you were feeling? I was feeling guilt. I was really guilty that I was out here in a paradise and people were suffering back home and um, I guess this is an issue that I've been dealing with uh, a long time in my life especially in the profession that I'm in that I I carry around a lot of empathy for my patients and compassion and I really want to help people so I said, this guilt is not something that's a one-time thing for you this is a guilt that's not all-time thing for you something that shows up a lot and she said, well, yeah. And I said, and the reason is she has a model of the world based on sacrifice. Her experience of sacrifice is ongoing. What she has to be able to do is her spiritual lesson is learning not how to not be guilty, but how to really love herself so she's got more to give these other people. How to learn that she's not the only source of everything. And if she can get to that point, then she'll start to feel worthy inside. And that'll change more than just how she interacts with her patients. That'll change her whole life. So my question is, how do you feel right now? By being guilty, how do you get love and connection? Uh, because I think that I feel that guilt will drive me to do more in order to... I want to try something. anger. Look at her. Yeah. <laughs> now, by the way, do you see why she uses it? Does this have anything to do with the World Trade Center, yes or no? Yes or no? No. no. Did the World Trade Center have anything to do with what she went through in reality, yes or no? No, it was a stimulant. It was a stimulant for her to run her pattern. He ran his pattern, she ran her pattern. Hers is to cry and get sad after first she connects with people, then feel really bad about it. But then eventually she can connect with people to come back whole again, right? You'll see a different pattern here and you'll see a different pattern here. These patterns existed before the World Trade Center and they'll exist after it unless they decide to change them. My name is Bernie. Uh, I am a human being. I am a Jew. I am an Orthodox Jew. I am a second generation Holocaust survivor. I am a property owner in Israel, in Jerusalem. I have close friends and family 
who live in Judea and Samaria, otherwise referred to as the West Bank. And when I heard the news this morning, I had my first, one of my first reactions was precisely the same as my brother Assad expressed earlier with the precisely the same language. Now they'll understand. And I probably had the same physiology, they're probably the same language, the same focus. Although I don't work in the World Trade Center, frequently go into the, take the E-train into the Chamber Street, uh, which goes under the World Trade Center, that massive uh, shopping mall and train, which at exactly 10 to 9, just last week, I was running for a meeting, running late, and I may very, you know, the, the probability of him being in that event was certainly higher. Listening to Assad and listening to the others, um, it suddenly occurred to me, it brings together people who, t who gave, took the same event and we gave it totally opposite meanings. One of the thoughts I had was that this same event that I am interpreting as this great, this, this very horrible destruction, there are people in the world today, right this moment, who are celebrating at their success of pulling off an amazing logistical nightmare. And uh, doctor, I forgot his name, I would like to invite you and take out the opportunity we have of being here together at Life Mastery to sit down with you and share with you certainly my perspective and my, my beliefs and, and my belief structures, because I was, I can probably have to admit that I was raised to hate Arabs. I mean, in my um, growing up, but I can tell you that neither I nor anybody I know who is more directly affected was ever raised with the concept that of, 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 of goal of being a suicide bomber. And I want to draw a distinction. And again, I invite you, obviously, because I, I know that you um, will see this from a different perspective. Um, would like to invite you to have a dialogue, although it may not affect the rest of the world, but if we can um, discuss this as human beings um, in this context, then it demonstrates that there is hope for greater hotheads to even change their perspective. That's, uh, that's Interestingly enough, he would likely have been in the World Trade Center, and he's here. He didn't know why he was here. He could have made a decision so much more easily and gone locally and not had to go through all that stress, but something guided him to be here, just like everybody else. So it's your opportunity to figure out why you're here. Let's consider Robin's options at this point. He could have organized a roundtable discussion with Bernie, Assad, Dr. Bashar, or another New Yorker. He could have chosen to work with one or more of these people separately and individually. Or he could have organized a negotiation or a debate between them. Instead, Robbins chose to do something quite different, to set up an indirect negotiation between two men who represented polar opposites. Assad, as he attempted to explain the belief in violence as a response to the suffering of his people, represented one extreme. Robbins could have chosen any New Yorker as Assad's counterpart, but he preferred to choose Bernie, a New York Jew with roots in Israel and a child of the Holocaust, as someone who, like Assad, also represented the suffering of past generations. He invited Bernie and Assad on stage to participate in a process of indirect negotiation. The purpose of indirect negotiation is to create a platform of mutual empathy between two people with opposing interests in order to prepare them for a productive interaction. The process consists of seven steps. One, introduce a meta frame. Two, clarify individual questions. Three, block direct communication. Four, internal individual negotiation. Five, listening and taking notes. Six, indirect agreement. Seven, direct agreement. In this instance, Robbins chose to create a metaframe using a sequence of Jungian archetypes. 
whenever you have a severe challenge of some sort and you're having difficulty resolving it, remember you're not going to resolve it with the same resources that you're trying to solve it with because what you're doing isn't working. If there's something you're struggling with, like an injustice or you don't know what to do or you're frustrated or you're hurt or you're sad, one way to do this is to tap into other parts of you. Now, in social psychology or in various forms of psychology, you know, throughout the world, people develop different stories, mythology, to help us be able through stories to learn how to deal with situations just like we're dealing with today. The problems we have of life and death, of betrayal, of coupling, of connecting, of the challenges that we go through with our children, all the challenges, aging. Mythologically, the reason that something becomes a myth, a story is a myth, is it's told so many times that the story is sustained for hundreds or thousands of years, hundreds or thousands. And so they're sustained because they have lessons within them. And in this mythology, there are archetypes. And depending upon which way you look at it, the archetypes usually show up in certain types. So we're going to use four archetypes that are built within you, that are resources within you, meaning all of us here. So the first archetype or part of you that we're going to talk about within you, the most, the fundamental one that most people will go for, especially in times of this situation, is the warrior. Now the warrior is a part of you that, think of the part of you that is probably the most intense, the most strong in its attack on anything. The warrior is about action and strength. The warrior is looking to do something, and they're doing something using their power. Okay? So there's a warrior part of you. There is a part of you that many of you would think of as a magician. Think of a magician as somebody who can detach from anything and just observe it. And a magician finds the magic in anything. A magician can snap their fingers and change something. They see things that other people get upset about as absurd. Because they have a totally different perspective. A magician just sees that it's all magic. It's all hocus pocus. It's all spells. It's all trances. It's all hypnosis. And the magician has a little bit of a whimsical view of things. The, the magician, as I jot him down here for, is, is that he's more involved in the invisible. He's more involved in intuition. And he knows it's easy. He knows it can be done in an instant. Whereas the warrior, how does a warrior handle it? Warrior's got to do it through strength and power and action. The magician might do it with a snap of a finger. The magician might do it by an insight or by the humor. Totally different view. Third one for you is the lover inside you. The lover, hopefully you don't need much description of, but the lover is really your deepest emotions of connection and love. This is where you vibrate with life. This is where all the deepest connections within you are. This is your connection to everything to God, to yourself, to other people, the deepest love you have. A love that does not have conditions. A love that is pure. The purest part of you, the most loving, pure part of you. And then finally, the fourth part is the sovereign. And the sovereign, in mythological terms, is the person who really, he knows your vision and purpose, he or she. The sovereign is the one who governs, has the ability at least to govern our lives. They know why you're here, they know what you're here to do, Think of them as like being a great king or queen who has just an enormous amount of wisdom and knowledge. They've been here before and they can command and they don't overreact. They know a wise sovereign. Now all four of these parts are inside of everybody in this room, every single person here. However, they're not only in every part of us, but they're not always in balance. Sometimes who's running the whole show is the warrior. And so everything is reacted to with that kind of response. Sometimes who's always in charge is the lover. And if anyone is always in charge, it gets exhausted. It is important to understand two distinctions between the strategic archetype process and most other therapies that use archetypes. Robin's archetypes work primarily as a sequence, which is more than the sum of the individual archetypes. Also, the strategic archetype process is solution-oriented as it is used to seek answers to a specific question that will lead to specific decisions and behaviors. The strategic archetypes process is rooted in physiology, as the participants identify parts of their body that are associated with each archetype. The strategy of indirect negotiation harnesses the force of emotion, turning it into a strength that will bring about unity. Indirect negotiation operates on two levels, internally and interpersonally. 
Internally, the process begins with the second step of clarifying individual questions. The force that would have been directed towards an opponent is thereby directed inwards, towards a clarification of one's own values and emotional states. In other words, the negotiation must begin on the inside before it can be directed outwards. Each man will redefine his problem as a primary question to be answered within his own self during the internal negotiation. And let's turn your chairs facing each other. So what's the question that you want to resolve? Red microphone. There are so many things flooding, um, but I guess the primary question that I want, I want to ask Assad is... No, no, it's the question I want you to ask yourself. Uh, it's a question I'm asking myself. Yes. Because here's what happens. As long as he wants to get Assad's answer, there's going to be some vested elements no matter how pure this man is. And he's a very pure man. And what you're going to do is you're going to capture as fast as you can. He's going to say, my lover, or we'll start out with uh, my warrior probably. My warrior says, my warrior says. That's the phrase you're going to say and the answer to the question. You're going to write down what he says. It'll be hard because if he's doing it well, he'll go fast. You're going to have to write as fast as you can. And hopefully you can read your, your writing afterwards. I'm getting you to do this because I can't. <laughs> I got symbols. Okay, so what's the question first? What's the thing you're struggling with that you'd like to resolve? That if you could resolve it, it creates pain for you or anger for you or frustration for you or it's overwhelming for you and you want to resolve it? The question I want to answer for myself in the context of, of, of today is this... I mean, Anything you, you want, but I, I'd like I to mean, see it relating in the, the context. The question that I, that I struggle with I mean, all the time um, is what is the answer to the situation? Okay, yeah. what is the answer to what situation specifically? The, situa the escalating cycle of violence on both sides. How do we find a peaceful resolution that does not involve one of, that, that allows both of us to live in our homelands? Great. How do we find a peaceful solution that allows both of us to live in our homelands? Okay, that's a, that's a question that he can begin to pursue an answer in. Okay? Now, that's a large question because it involves things he can't necessarily what? Okay. Control. So now you brought up a great question, and you can pursue the answer to that question within yourself first, and then you can pursue it later on with Assad, right, on your own. But what I now want you to do is convert that question to why it's important to you. What's the real question behind that question? There's a real question relating to you behind that question. So what do you got to solve in you? What is it you need to resolve? Resolving what my true feelings are. I mean, when I said, you know, I was, you know, I sort of, you know, I, I, I sort of regret what I said earlier about, you know, I was raised in hate because I'm not sure. Uh, it was raised, but I'm trying to resolve, you know, what is it exactly that I feel, you know, because because um, I also, you know, when I look at it as a group of people, okay, is, is resolving the the group of, you know, the label we give to the Arabs versus an individual, okay, right. and. Uh, I think it was, um, it was so much what Sad expressed, the, the conflict of, you know, I don't wish any individual harm. You have all kinds of things that are going on now simultaneously. So let's just come down to one thing. What do I need to do? I'll give you a question if I may for simplicity's sake. What do I need to believe, understand, or do now to take the situation and use it to make me a better person and somehow serve others that I care about as well? And make the sounds of your warrior. <gasps> Do it again. <gasps> Do it again. <gasps> and then just say, my warrior says, my warrior says, and you say whatever pops your mind, and don't filter it mentally, and keep that energy, keep feeling that energy. And I like to have you stand, because I think you'd be standing in a warrior state. Stand in that state, and just tell you, my warrior says, my warrior says, my warrior says, go. My, my warrior says, wait, but no, my warrior, uh, I'm not to Stay with your warrior. Trying, you, 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 you watch me, yeah, my, my, get the hell out of here. Come in here to your warrior. My, my, Make my, the sound again. Uh, again. Uh, again. Uh, again. Stay here. What does your warrior say? A way to make yourself better today, now, in a way that'll make you better and long term so serve both Arabs and Israelis. Warrior says what? My warrior says, let's sit down. Stay there. Let, let me, uh, yeah, I can't. It's. The, uh, my war is over, overpowered, I guess, by, um, 
that can't come with any positive side of the warrior, if you're asking. You can't come to a positive side of this warrior. Uh, I can't. If you're asking for a positive, um, how, I will use that. That's right. I'm asking uh, the warrior, because, not the dead warrior right. who's going to die because all he does is fight like a stupid ass. Mm -hmm. A warrior who has a purpose beyond fighting. A warrior who's really trying to serve a higher good. Not an asshole that was conditioned from youth. Not someone who lives in pain. A real warrior, not a thug who calls himself a warrior so he can feel better about himself. A thug is out just to create violence because they felt violence themselves at one time or someone they cared about. That's a thug. A warrior has a higher purpose. In talking to Bernie, Robbins is talking to Assad. This is an indirect way of addressing Assad without engaging his sensitivity to domination. Robbins is also deliberately intense on Bernie in order to leave the option open of being hard on Assad. The warrior, to sit down with the other warrior and um, from a position of from strength as warriors to, to talk, to actually do the, the, the planning side of what a warrior does. To change our focus, we must become someone we are not. At this moment, Robbins has positioned both Assad and Bernie to become another. The archetypes are imaginary entities that are used to bring out an alternative identity in each man. The process of internal negotiation begins for Bernie as he struggles to find his warrior. Assad's attention is intensely focused on Bernie as he must take notes of everything that Bernie says and so incorporates Bernie into himself. Is recognize how, the, how you, this experience can make you a better person, how you can share this with others, take the message to the world and make the, make the message global. That's right. The, the, the warrior says, tell Tony to distribute the videotapes, the, the live video feed from these, from these events, <laughs> to, to make that message global. So Bernie, now I want your magician. Where's your magician? Okay. Good. All right. Have, have your hands up. Okay. The magician. And I'll hold this for you. Okay, because I want you to stay with it. Make the magician sounds. Puff. Make the magician at his best. Puff. That's it. <laughs> now keep on hanging on the magician now. Remember, the magician comes to a place of the humor of it. The magician sees the simplicity. The magician is not caught up like the warrior even slightly. The magician has a completely different perspective on this. The magician knows how to snap their fingers and create a change instead of having to fight forever to make it happen. The magician has magic available, and the magician is kind of playful. I'll turn you this way to outside so you can see him too. Up here, it's hard to hear. Go ahead. Uh, the, the magician says, you know, uh, you know, just, hey, why don't we just, you know, play volleyball? <laughs> <laughs> The magician says, hey, let's go sailing. <laughs> the, ma the magician says, you know, um, let's take a, a um, clean piece, of, a clean map with um, nothing but uh, latitude and longitude uh, without, without the, uh, with just the water. And uh, let's just, you know, create you know, the map the way, we, the way we lay out this floor, th this room. The magician says, wouldn't it be nice if, and what if we could, and perhaps we can. By the uh, way, these phrases, the magician's offering, interrupt the entire pattern and create something possible. The magician says, it's, you know, let's just have fun. That's, that's okay. The magician, <laughs> the magician says, says, we can be happy. The magician, the magician says, is, we don't even need land to be happy. The magician says, I mean, just, just be happy. The, uh, the magician says there's plenty of room on the planet. 
Magician says to me. Magician says to me. Bring your kid up differently. Robbins is moved to tears when Bernie's magician tells him to raise his child without the sense of us versus them. Bernie's child, by the way, is still a month from being born. Bernie's commitment in relation to his unborn child is a commitment of the highest level and shows he is taking full responsibility for the meanings he creates. He does so without even needing the discussion he wanted with Assad. His conviction comes from within, and he doesn't need to get it from anyone else. How's that for an answer? Mm. That's where the problem is, and that's where the answer is. That's it. The magician is so wise. All right. Give us your lover. Where's your lover? The question for the lover is, what do I, Bernie, need to do today to take this event and make it the most powerful transformation of my whole life? Have me become better today because of this than I've ever been. And as a result, long-term serve all of humanity. My lover says, um, Can't we all just get along? <laughs> Very good. The, um, That's good. My lover says. My, 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 see a state change here? My, my lover my, says. My, my lover says, you know, love is more important than war. My lover says, Bernie, go home and give your wife a hug. My lover uh, says, Bernie. My lover says, Bernie, Dove, a Hebrew name. Um, Says, says, Bernie. Bernie. Bernie says, um, Bernie. Uh, Bernie, hug your friends, hug your family. Um, my mother says, tell your mother again that you love her. <laughs> um, what does your lover say about Assad? My lover says, Assad has, I'm sure, pretty much the same feelings. Mm -hmm. my, my lover says, Assad, has the same, the same kind of lover, the same kind of, um, is, is being driven by the same passions, mm. his feelings. Uh... As the lover, Bernie quickly moves to the deepest level of loving and feeling loved. He refers to himself by his Hebrew name, Dove, which carries strong family affection. And he slips at one point from saying, my lover says, to my mother says. At the point at which Bernie is contemplating his love for his mother, Robbins asks Bernie to say something about Assad. In the midst of feeling so loving and loved, Bernie answers that he sees Assad as having the same lover, the same passion, as being fully equivalent. When Bernie identifies with the extreme imaginary entity of his lover, he realizes that Assad must experience the same emotional processes. Where's your sovereign? There we go. Make the sounds of your sovereign the king, the wise king, mm -hmm. who knows what you're made for, who mm -hmm. knows the road ahead. Mm hmm I understand. Good. Tell us, as King says to Bernie, you can I'll put one hand up here. The King wants control. 
the king says to Bernie, you know, choose your words carefully. And the sovereign says, speak only after great thought. The sovereign says, choose your, your emotions with care. And the sovereign says, choose your expressions. As the sovereign, Bernie recognizes that not only we can choose our words and our thoughts, but also our emotions. What's the question aside that you want to resolve within yourself, or the conflict you want to resolve within yourself? You said you came here with enormous frustration. I guess, uh... I'm, I'm wondering what is it that I feel that they're taking from me okay. that is making my life less okay. so what if we made the question what is it that I've been focusing on that makes me believe someone is making me less and what could I do today to no longer ever feel less again? Because that would resolve it then. Yes. OK, does that work for you? Yes. OK, great. Why don't you stand up? And what I want you to do is, let's start with your warrior. Where is your warrior? From that place. Make the sounds of your warrior. <sighs> do it again. <sighs> do it again. Now, from your warrior, tell me the answer to this question. What is it that you believe they have been taking from you that makes you feel less? And what can you do today so that you no longer have to live in reaction and can become free forever? The warrior says, let's fight together. Who was he speaking of? The warrior says, who's to fight together? All of us, everyone. The warrior says, let's fight together in order to what? In order to do something new, to feel something new, to experience something different. And the warrior says we should fight together for what? For freedom. Of whom? of our captured hearts and minds. Have the word tell us how. How do we fight together for our captured hearts and minds? The warrior says. The warrior says, Puts your, put your swords down take off your armor and walk to the other side and look into the eyes of the person you're fighting. And then give him a hug. Ask the warrior, how can a warrior do that? Ask the warrior, how can a warrior do that when they know so much pain has been induced? So much hurt. How can one walk to this side, look in the eyes and hug? The warrior knows. Ask the warrior. The warrior says, show your cuts and bruises to your enemy and tell them to give you a band-aid. Assad's answers as the warrior are greatly accelerated by Bernie's process that Assad has assimilated in a profound way. The fighting has become communal. We fight together in the same way we play volleyball together, and the opponents are not other people but our own limiting patterns. 
Assad's metaphors of disarming himself and of opening up physically and emotionally to his enemy attest to the empathy he has gained in relation to Bernie. Now, not only he is empathetic to the other situation, he even demands empathy by asking for a Band-Aid. As each man witnesses the other's struggle to identify with each archetype, both can't help but to realize that they are equals and part of the same emotional universe. Warrior to warrior, Bernie and Assad are beginning to reach indirect agreement. They are both warriors who do not want war. The warrior says, The warrior says, stop fighting and start healing. The warrior says, I'm tired. That's right, I'm tired. The warrior says, the warrior says, I want to chill and have some olives. Let's chill and have some olives. The warrior says, the warrior says, let's go climb some mountains and Let's go cut some trees and let's go raft some rivers and swim some oceans. Yes, those are things warriors were made to do, but they don't have much time for when all they do is fight. Warriors are people of action, people of courage. All those things are active use of the warrior in a courageous way. It causes the warrior to face fear and to triumph. The purpose of the warrior is to find within you a greater level of inner strength not to fight with others. This warrior clearly knows that. This is a mature warrior, not a dumb kid. A mature warrior understands that. The purpose of a warrior is to break through fear, which is the whole reason for war is fear. A true warrior breaks through fear. They do it by training themselves in other ways other than war. The warrior says, Assad, The warrior says, Assad, your demon is tired, so you can chill. Your demon's tired, so let's chill. <laughs> the warrior says, Assad. The warrior says, Assad, <laughs> make love. <laughs> Ask your warrior what he values most now, because he's matured, obviously. What does he value most now? The warrior says, I value. The warrior says, I value inner power. Inner power. The warrior says, I value. Joy. Mm, very nice. Passion. Passion. Love. Desire. Courage. Let's go to your magician. Okay? And make the sounds of your magician. Make the sounds of your magician again. And we ask your magician 
what is it that I've been focusing on so much that it makes me feel like they're taking it from me and therefore I'm less? And what can I focus on, believe, or understand forever now or do that will free me from this so I will never again feel less than, nor will I have to force someone to know that I am more than? The magician says. The magician says. Remember the, remember the magician? You can see it in the blink of an eye. The magician is that part that sees the humor in it. The magician is a little impish fun. The magician can make a change in a second that someone else has to fight for. The magician says, You're not having fun. Magician says, you're not in love. Mm. Magician says, find the passion. Mm. Find the passion. Magician says, smell the flowers. Mm. Eat some olives. <laughs> and volleyball is cool, too. <laughs> volleyball is cool, too. Magician says, go plant some flowers, fall in love, make love, and go eat some olives. The magician, the magician says, Assad. Magician says, Assad. <laughs> Just be a kid again. It's just, it's okay. It's cool. Oh. Let's go to your lover. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> The lover it's a, says. It's about time. <laughs> the lover says. <sighs> the lover says. <sighs> it's okay to fight. Just fight with love. Mm, very nice, very nice. What does the lover mean? The lover means that whenever you're out there, fighting the demons of your own limitations, do it with spirit, and do it with heart, and do it with love. Oh. The lover says. The lover says, eat some olives. <laughs> it must be peace food. The lover says. The lover says, 
Listen to the ocean. Hear the peaceful melody of the waves. The lover says, walk on the sand. Let the sunshine soak into your heart and your soul. The lover says, hold hands. The lover says, look into your own eyes and find the love that's always been there. The lover says, let the flower in every cell of your body bloom. Mm. Lover says, volleyball is good. <laughs> Lover says, let's play. And then <laughs> let's play and then Make love. The lover says Assad. The lover says Assad. Just smile. Just smile. The lover says Assad. The lover says Assad. There is a brother and a sister on the other side. And a mother and a father. And a son and a daughter. And it's all here in your heart, too. So if you kill, you're killing a part of yourself. Sovereign. The Sovereign says, if you're having fun, and if you're making love and having olives and playing volleyball, then there are no problems. The sovereign says, it's time to put down the weapons and sing. Sovereign says. What's the hesitancy when you tell me what the Sovereign says? It's too big. What's too big? The Sovereign's too big? It's too big for me. You're not big enough to be a king. Ask the magician what he thinks of that. The magician's laughing. Ask the magician if this is you or not, if the sovereign is also you. It is if I have the courage. Ask your lover if you have the courage. <laughs> yeah, baby. Ask your warrior if you have the courage. It's time for a new kind of courage. Oh. It's time for a new kind of courage. Ask the three of them to take you personally and introduce you to the sovereign.
because there is something you may not have considered that the sovereign is really God in you as you guiding you is you if that's not too big What's the magician saying right now while he's watching all this? Magician's looking at his watch and saying it's about time. Mm. What's the lover saying right now? He's saying the sooner you do it, the sooner we we'll fall in love. What's the warrior say? Let's go have some fun. Go to the sovereign. Hmm? Go to your sovereign. Is it you? Tell you what, make him a prince. Don't make him a king. Okay. <laughs> that you can do. Yes. Okay, make him a prince. All right. Simon says, aside, never forget. Always remember. Never forget. Always remember. Always remember. There is a mother and a sister and a father and a son and a daughter. And they feel the same kind of love and the same kind of pain as your own mother, as your own sisters, as your own father. And you're all family anyway. Each of these two men worked through his emotional archetypes in the presence of each other. They developed a powerful natural empathy for each other. Each recognized that the other's position was equal to his own. They recognized that they both had experienced the same love and the same pain. Since Robbins blocked direct conversation between the two from taking place, an indirect conversation arose between the men as they worked on answering their individual questions. Far from merely taking turns in undergoing separate processes, the two men functioned as a unit, building rapport, initiating new meanings for each other, and accelerating each other's understanding. Warrior to warrior, magician to magician, lover to lover, and sovereign to sovereign. By the time they first addressed each other directly in conversation outside of the conference room, they had already merged their emotional resources in a profound way. 
Bernie and Assad started the day offering to represent the suffering and the frustration of their respective communities. By the end of the day, through the process of indirect negotiation, they not only reached direct agreement, they became actual leaders. Bernie and Assad have started an organization for the mutual understanding between Jews and Muslims. The organization, entitled Passion and Action for Peace, has now associates all over the world dedicated to the pursuit of peace. Assad has written a book titled My Jihad, A Muslim Man's Journey from Hate to Love. And yesterday we had a meeting, yesterday morning, it was, it was just a kick-ass meeting. And basically what we decided was that we have to take this message one person at a time across the world. And you know what? If we do that, if each one of us takes responsibility, for what we feel inside here, it doesn't matter what governments think. It doesn't matter how many bombs they make. Nobody can ever change what you feel inside here, and there are not going to be any wars and none of that stuff, because we're going to decide what happens. And that's what we... <laughs> we're planning on articles in newspapers and magazines, possibly a book, um, going into synagogues, mosques, and churches, schools, colleges, and talking to people, every possible way that we can influence people one at a time, that's what we're going to do. And what we're looking for is to make a fundamental shift in the way everybody feels, because that's what I experienced. I experienced a fundamental shift, how I felt inside. I was, you know, I'm standing next to Bernie, and suddenly, you know, instead of looking at him as a guy on the other side, I'm looking at him as a father, as a son, as a brother. He's got a mother, he's got a son, he's got a daughter. And I'm thinking, you know, this is my family. And now no matter what I feel, Now, no matter what I feel, even if I feel anger at him, even if I feel frustration at him, I mean, we all do, at our parents, our brothers, sisters, there's that love inside, there's that connection inside that no matter what, you know you can't hurt him, you know? <laughs> so, so that's, that's the outcome, to develop that conviction, that feeling inside here, so that you can't, you, you just have to look out for, for the other guys, good, no matter, no matter what anger, no matter what frustration you're feeling. And so what we came up with, came up with a lot of stuff, but one thing that I want to, com uh, to, to share with everybody is our, um, our incantation, that's it, incantation, and that is passion and action for peace. Ooh, that's Passion and action for peace. Passion and action for peace. Passion. I know there are many ways to share one's spiritual belief, but a prayer from each of you for everyone here. And I know that many of you have different belief structures, but I think we can appreciate the beauty of that prayer and take in the energy in which it's being sent. So let's have one from each of you. Do you want me to do it in Arabic? Yes, please. Okay. Auzu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahir rabbil alamin. Ar rahmanir rahim. Malik yawmiddin. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Ihdina siratal mustaqim, siratal ladina an'amta alayhim ghairil maghdub alayhim balad dhalim. Allahu Akbar. You went from your burning? Oh, wow. 
העולם כולו, גשר צר מאוד, גשר צר מאוד, גשר צר מאוד, כל העולם כולו, the entire world is nothing but a, nev is a very narrow bridge, is a very narrow bridge. And the most important thing is not to be afraid. Gesher Tsar Miyod Gesher Tsar Miyod Gesher Tsar Miyod Kol Haolam Kulo The entire world is a very narrow bridge is a very narrow bridge Ve-ha-i-kar Ve-ha-i-kar And the most important thing is not to be afraid. Lo lefachen klal.